Hey, y'all got a cigarette? Um, we don't smoke. Fuck off! I thought instead I'd have some fun. Uh, that's why I went with the uh, name that I did, uh. Mr. Medicare. It's kind of a uh, inside jab at some people I used to know uh, to infuriate them a little bit. Okay, yes, that, I kind of like that actually. That definitely goes along with your brand. Oh, by, by the way, I'm recording just you know in case you feel inclined to give me credit card information or something. So you <laughs> yeah, not a problem. Awesome. Okay, so so you're basically pissing off some people with a new name. I, I, I was uh, I was surprised you came back with a different uh, would it be a moniker. Because the old one is pretty cool. Obviously, a lot of people grew, grew attached to that, but it's still the uh, the same old content, so it's pretty awesome. Yeah, I, I know. It's weird. Um, a lot of people like the the guy in the wig picture, uh, which is funny because the company that that picture is pulled from was, a, I believe, a costume shop, a Halloween store. Okay. Uh, they, they went out of business. Now, if they'd stuck around for maybe an extra year, they probably would have sold a few of those, but they're, they're long gone. Uh, it was probably one of the first images in the Google search I did for Aristocrat. Uh. I was like, that that'll work. So I went with that picture. At least if you were using that, there can't be any kind of copyright claim that they're gone. Oh, yeah, 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 they're, they're long gone. Um, I'm not sure what happened. I'm not even sure who the particular person that modeled for that is or if they're even aware that I was using it. But, yeah, I, I used it for about a good year, year or two, and then uh, shut down the channel. Yeah, it looks like it just when somebody, like, listening to your voice, I just have that picture in my mind the whole time. Like, it's like that actual guy talking. <laughs> yeah, a, a lot of people have told me that. Um, some people didn't like the the new logo, I guess, on the new channel, uh, uh, the original one, which was the uh, kind of heavy set gentleman giving a uh, a finger pointing towards people. So I switched it up and went with the I, I don't know, kind of an homage to Scout because uh, people the dude with the hat. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> went with that. So I like that better actually because I was I was watching one of your videos when I just found out you were back again. And I was looking at that dude, and it, that gave a very different impression. Seeing like this kind of like fat guy with a mustache, and he seemed kind of rude. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that was the thing. I mean, I, I used to know uh, the guy that that's modeled after uh, was somebody I used to know named Haberman, um, and the name itself, Medicare, was a, a group that it was a forum actually that I was a member of, uh, and Haberman ended up shutting down the forum and. Uh, reformed his ways, so to speak, and he kind of became an SJW himself after oh, being good. on Tumblr, on Tumblr for too long. So when I came back, I thought, you know, fuck it, um, I'll, I'll I'll use the image and use the name and have some fun. Uh, but people apparently really hated that image. Uh, I got a good laugh out of it, but it was like, well, I, I guess I can compromise a little bit and switch it up to the uh, to the Scout logo. I like the Scout logo. The the, the yeah. fat guy that was kind of pissing me off too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's not too bad. I think it turned out okay. So I'm I'm curious. Well, what inspired you originally? You, like even coming back, because I, like I know like a lot of your content. Like this stuff is is pretty new to me. Like the whole SJW thing, and uh, feminist craziness, and all this kind of stuff. Like I used to just you know like I don't go on Tumblr and all that kind of bullshit. I didn't really know about this whole world till I discovered your videos because a friend posted it and I thought it was fucking hilarious. And um, I started doing my own research and going through news articles and videos and stuff. I thought, well, there's a lot of real, lot of real crazy fucks out there. And um, so, this, so this whole thing, it, like, it almost puts you in a weird haze. Like when you get into this in internet world of all these like uh, Twitter uh, hashtag activists and all these kind of people or Tumblr people, it makes you feel kind of like disjointed because it's like this isn't like they, it seems like they're very out of touch with reality. What? What inspired you to start kind of attacking this sort of stuff and doing satires and uh, sarcastic videos? Um, I guess that's kind of always been something I did. I mean, I, I like to poke fun at things. Um, mm -hmm. For a lot of the accounts that I had well before Internet Aristocrat, that's kind of what I did. Okay. Uh, just, just various groups on the Internet or uh, kind of subsets. Uh, you had like Juggalos or you had um, uh, the Sonic fandom, just stuff like that. It was more lighthearted. Uh, really kind of stuff but with the SJW stuff you've really seen that kind of rise to prominence I'd say in the last two to three years maybe mm. four years um, it really in part I think is kind of perpetuated by Tumblr itself because I, th I think you have a lot of college kids that basically learn about this in class yeah. uh, from whatever kind of a social science course they're taking and then they want to talk about it so where are they going to talk about it what platform are they going to use well they might use Facebook but Tumblr has kind of been crafted for this this demographic, this audience, and so they go on um, 
and it's almost like a, the problem is almost like twofold because not only are they going on with what they learned in the classroom, but it's a game of telephone, so they're mixing it up even more. Yeah. So it becomes even more ludicrous and even more ridiculous uh, when it's reposted. And so you get all these things like people talking about microtransgressions and, uh, or I'm sorry, microaggressions. I can't even yeah. keep track of this stuff at this point. Headmates and uh, kin types and uh, you know the preferred pronouns. And, and the scary thing is, at first you could just kind of laugh at it and wave it off like it wasn't a big deal. Yeah. But what ends up happening is people don't just use one social media platform. It's not just, I'm going to use Tumblr and nothing else. They start to go other places. And this idea, this stuff they pick up, it goes with them. So now you see with, I believe at Facebook in America, if you have an American account, you have preferred pronouns listed on your profile page. On Facebook? Which, yeah. Really? Yeah. I, I believe, I could be wrong on this. If you look into it, I'm, I'm fairly certain that's true now. Um, it just, just, Weird things like that. I mean, even look at Twitter, what they're doing right now with their new CEO, uh, yeah. new harassment policies. Uh, they're going to be purging 10 million accounts, apparently, uh, yeah. which is ridiculous because if you look at, they released their first quarter earnings, I believe, and their stock just dropped. This was one week after the new harassment uh, policy they're putting into place, and it lost like 22% of its value. Crazy. And then they, the, the CEO comes out and says, yeah, we're going to we're going to purge 10 million accounts because they're not safe for work. They're posting inappropriate things, pornography essentially, yeah. and it's making it hard for us to monetize the platform. We can't get advertisers to come in and want to do this. So it, it's just this mentality of let's take something that was uh, attractive or interesting because it was chaotic because you could go on the platform and yeah, you're going to run into stuff that you don't like, but that's part of the appeal. Yeah. And let's make it into this squeaky clean, PC friendly, safe space where nobody's feelings get hurt. And it's just, yeah, and that mentality, that that kind of attitude is really pushed by these people. And I, I see Tumblr as kind of like that focal point, is it, like ground zero, really, of spreading it to other mm -hmm. social media platforms like Twitter and like Facebook and everybody, YouTube, I'm sure, as well. Mm -hmm. I, I saw actually a post by um, or just some internet thing, but this the CEO or the, or maybe former CEO, or one of the co-founders of the uh, of Tumblr, he said something to the effect of um, like he didn't really mean to have these kind of people on there, but now the kind of people that are on there are just basically attacking the kind of person he is, like a, a white a white man, right? Yeah. And they're using that to attack people like him. Like he said it better than I'm saying it, but something to that effect. Yeah, he probably didn't foresee that the platform he helped to develop would end up being used to attack the person that developed it. Yeah. Uh, it, it's almost like a, a similar situation to the original founders of YouTube. I remember when Google put into place the uh, policy, this was like, I think, seven or eight months back, that you to have a YouTube account, you must absolutely link it to a Google Plus to be able to comment. Mm -hmm. And one of the founders, I can't remember which one, hadn't been on to his YouTube account since like 2007. And he popped on to say, what in the fuck are you doing, Google? And that was the last comment he made. So it's kind of funny watching the people who create these platforms, seeing where they're going. So I can imagine the guy that made Tumblr is thinking, what in the hell have I created? Uh, I tried to make a social network, and it really has become this, this joke, this carnival on the yeah. Internet that's just spawning off ridiculous things. It's a monster. It's it's the it's the worst, though, when it actually translates into like real life, like in real life policies. Like You probably know what the... Uh... The, Calif the California um, anti-rape policy on, on university campuses, right? Now, is that the one where, well, see, and this is a crazy thing. Like, if we were having this conversation five years ago, I'd say, oh, I know exactly what you're talking about. But at this point, there are so many policies in place that it's hard to keep track. Is that the consent at every step one? Is that the um, one where the school does their own investigation into rape allegations and has the proponents of ed or evidence decided by them rather than the legal system? Like, wow. what? which one are we talking about? Jesus, now, now you're confusing me. I, just, I thought there was one uh, going down a, a deep, um, dark road here. Um, yeah. The one I was thinking about was the one, well, it's kind of like it has, it has a big umbrella, but it's, it's like um, if... To the, to, you know, if both of the people were drinking, but the girl was drinking too, so the guy raped her. Um, yeah, I think it's like the step-by-step -step thing too. Like you have to ask for consent verbally at every step. Kind of like yeah, and how, how crazy it is. I think it was the Chappelle Show did a skit four or five years back yeah. making fun of this, where they basically had a, a, a comedy skit. It was like three or four minutes long where it was two, two college students wanting to have sex with, e with each other, and they had lawyers in the room. Oh like yeah. They had to yeah. sign like triplicate forms to be able to touch each other and come to an agreement on how far they were going to go. 
and now they're actual there's an app out there the consent app where you get consent at every step they have to sign their name and enter information if they click no I think it sends a message to the police it's really crazy wow but wow. um that's crazy. yeah that, you, you yeah. can't even imagine the stuff well yeah I mean it's taking people who are at a point where they're young adults and they need to start learning about responsibility they need to start learning about decision making and basically they, they've, they've transitioned out of high school and out of mom and dad's house essentially I mean they may be still living there because it's cheaper because college is so damn expensive but yeah for the most part they're kind of spreading their wings and going out on their own and it's coddling them it's telling them you're not adult enough to make a decision you're not adult enough to live with the consequences if you do something and you regret it we'll let you blame it off as something like this and that's not to minimize people who are actually been raped or girls that have found themselves in situations that were uncomfortable or wrong yeah. but uh, uh, this this attitude that's going on right now on campuses where it's it almost seems like they want to treat them like they're in elementary school like you couldn't possibly make a decision you couldn't yeah. possibly decide to take a shot of whiskey and then decide to have sex yeah I, if you're I, a woman I, yeah if you're a woman yeah if you're a man that's tough luck because men can't be raped uh, according to tumblr and uh, apparently quite a few university campuses at this point uh, because that the whole oh god what is it the privilege plus power um, is what defines whether or not something is a transgression so mm. White people can't be, uh, you can't be racist against white people, you can't rape a man, you can't be sexist against men, um, you can't discriminate against the rich. It, it's anybody that has privilege and power essentially can, are, are, they're fair game at this point. That's interesting. I, I, with this whole kind of uh, genre of, of bullshit, I've always wondered, because I'm mixed race, I'm half Mexican, half Caucasian, mm -hmm. so I was wondering if I have immunity from them because of my mixed race status, or I'm just a white guy in disguise, or how this works, I'm not sure. Well, yeah, you think it would be funny to kind of sit there and try to puzzle it out, but if you look at uh, Occupy Wall Street, I think it was, it wasn't the, it wasn't Zuccotti Park, it was another one of their kind of side rallies, but they introduced the progressive stack, and they addressed that. They actually created a list that wrote who had the most privilege in every specific group you could imagine. So they had males who were completely white, who were Mexican, who were black, who were Asian, who were mixed. Were they straight? Were they not straight? Were they transsexual? Were they not transsexual? Atheist or theist? Then they had women and then disabled. And they created this list that had about two, three hundred entries, essentially. And you could track where you were on the privilege scale. Wow. Yeah, it's, an, it's insane. Uh, they're, they're, it's insane is really the only way to put it, I guess. I heard, uh, I saw some other video about another guy who uh, did similar stuff to you. I think he, he mentioned something about the whole, uh, the, the Occupy Wall Street, how that was just like a lot of movements that are kind of co-opted by uh, feminists and SJWs. And they basically, um, they kind of screwed the Occupy Wall Street movement by making it a, a crazy house instead of what it was about, which was the, you know, the, the Wall Street corruption and the financial system. And then we turn into like your chosen gender and like a whole, all the other craziness that comes along with it. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I've talked about this myself uh, in the past, but you basically had what a, a gathering of people who had a very simple point. I mean, I'm sure their their platform wasn't completely specific; it was a little bit vague. Mm. But at the end of the day, they had a couple of core points. One, we don't like corruption. I mean, who's going to disagree with that? Who's going to say I want corrupt politicians? Yeah. Who's going to say I want banks to be able to buy my politicians? That seems really simple. I, I can't imagine anybody of any political persuasion saying no. I disagree with that. I want my politicians to be completely corrupt and bought by any rich person that exists yeah so you, you so you, they're out in the street they're protesting this and they're they're doing it their way essentially in the beginning hmm. but it, it, it kind of meanders it starts to go off into this really bizarre direction where it stops being about financial corruption and political collusion and starts getting into territories like I remember seeing uh, occupy rallies where they were talking about Native American rain dance rights where they were talking about establishing uh, no rape zones Oh shit! Which that in itself is just surreal to me. I, I understand that they they were reported that there were two to three assaults that took place over the span of Occupy Wall Street. I think in Zuccotti, um, but yeah. So they established areas basically there were no rape zones. So if you were in that, uh, I don't know how that works. I mean, I guess it's Scout's honor. If you walk into this zone, you're not going to rape anybody. Step outside of it, and you're fair game. But in that zone, you can't touch anybody. And it just it got ludicrous. And they introduced the progressive stack. And they started talking about, well, if you're, uh, you know, a transsexual black midget, you should be able to speak before the white straight male, even though what you may be saying could be completely bonkers and have nothing to do with politics or banking or anything. Mm -hmm. But because you're less privileged, you should speak first. 
And by the time people had started to really grasp how crazy things had gotten, they were already the butt of jokes across America. I mean, you can look at uh, the Colbert Report. Colbert um, was sympathetic to Occupy Wall Street. Mm -hmm. He actually donated money and he donated these uh, bicycles that generated electricity so they could run computers and stuff like that. <clears throat> so, I mean, he, he felt bad for him or he sympathized or he thought it was a good mm. platform in the beginning. So he goes down there and he's going to do two episodes. He's going to give them the chance to tell America and all those millions of people watching the Colbert Report, what are you about? And who do they send to do the interview with Stephen Colbert? They send, you know, it's almost like the stereotypical SJW hipster. You know, they've got the thick-rimmed glasses. They're mm. wearing the crazy-looking clothes. They're doing all these bizarre hand signals. Uh, the woman introduces herself as ketchup uh, and says that she's female-bodied. And he's like, what are you talking about? And by the time that interview was over, uh, that, was, that to me at least, watching this kind of take place in real time, was the death of Occupy Wall Street. Um, when you've got somebody who's giving you a platform to basically go on television and say, this is what we're about, and you go on instead and start talking about crazy shit, it's, it's game over. You're not going to recover from that. Yeah, I, I saw a video clip of that. I didn't watch the whole thing. I just remember the kind of androgynous looking people. Um, I didn't, yeah, I didn't watch it. I just saw that was enough for me. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was just surreal. And I, I'm thinking the entire time is, okay, he's going to make jokes. That's what the Colbert Report does, but mm. he'll give you a few minutes. You're going to have a couple minutes to respond, so at least at least say, hey, yeah, we're against this and we're against this, but they didn't. They were mm. too enamored with the idea of being on TV and being, I, I don't know, able to tell people about how progressive they were that they never got around to saying, yeah, we shouldn't. Uh, essentially, they, they had their opportunity to really uh, reverse course and get the message out and sway mainstream America, who they were trying to talk to, and they just they dropped the ball. <laughs> it was something you mentioned already, or you're talking about, but... Uh, about uh, you know like if you're a black uh, transsexual midget then you should be able to speak first and I saw a video clip on that um, in your video with the, that crazy woman uh, speaking to the audience saying that women have to speak first in classes oh yeah yeah that that's a policy she's trying to push she actually implemented that in her own classroom so she was suggesting it for the college she was visiting uh, Dalhousie University but she actually uses that in her own classroom so if you're a woman uh, this is how she has it structured. In a classroom, if there are any men at all, they cannot ask a question, they can't ask for clarification, they can't suggest anything, they can't offer their insight or their opinion, they can't speak first when an assignment is due, a woman has to do it first. Because they are pr or privileged, and the only way to counteract that privilege is by making them wait to go last. So what happens in the situation where you paid five hundred, six hundred, seven hundred dollars how many, you know, who knows how many credits the class is, you're sitting there, you've paid a lot of money, this is for your degree, mm -hmm. you've worked your ass off, and you've got an important question, a test is coming up, or you have an assignment you need clarification on. But none of the female participants in the class, maybe they all know what to do, they don't need to ask a question. Well, tough luck for you, you don't get to speak, you're privileged. You should be able to figure that out on your own. It, it's, it's insane. It's like putting, uh, what is it, the University of uh, Santa Barbara, I think it was, was the one that wanted to put trigger warnings on their class syllabi. To, you know, because you might read Shakespeare and go, oh my God, I heard a word that's offended me and I can't, I can't recover from it. I mean, you know, God bless college students, but I remember going through it myself. We're lazy as hell when you're mm. in college. You want to cut corners if you can. So if you're telling classes of students, if you're triggered by something, you don't have to participate in it. Who the hell's going to show up to take a test? Who's going to do the assignment? They're all going to be triggered by it because they don't want to read Hamlet or they don't want to, you know, go through the text. So it's, it's made, college was supposed to be a place that you could go to, cha or to challenge ideas and politics and to talk about, just to express yourself, to, to talk about anything. And it's changed that. It's made it so you can't do that anymore. You have to conform. It's not a place to grow anymore. It's a place to shrink. And it's, it's an affront to what education or higher education is supposed to be. You're not fostering young minds. You're not guiding them along. You're not helping them explore new things, you're stifling any creativity or new insight they might ever have and making them conform to groupthink. And worse than that, you're, you're giving people complexes. You're telling anybody that's not a part of these new um, special privilege minority groups that uh, they're worthless. Hmm. You know, it, it's thrown aside the idea of merit. You know, how good is your idea? How good is your argument? How compelling is it? 
And instead it's saying your skin color decides whether we listen to you, your sexual organs decides whether we will listen to you. And that kind of ideology, that rhetoric, everybody knows what that is. We've gone through that already. It's reverse chorus. It's not saying to the black guy anymore, hey, you can't speak because you're black. It's saying to the white guy, hey, you can't speak because you're white. So how these colleges are adopting these kind of doctrines is beyond me, or how they're not seeing what it is, and that the, they're repurposing old ideologies is just, it's insanity. Yeah, I'm, I'm like, actually, I'm really shocked, um, especially doing the research now, how this stuff can even exist. And like in like mainstream institutions, like it's a big, it's really widespread in, in the Western world. It's just insane how these things, which are obviously sexist and racist, can be okay somehow it, like it it just blows my mind like i don't even know how to put it in words it's like it's kind of like an affront to um old progressive values or at least the way i understand them where we're actually striving for real equality not instead of replacing uh, a power class with another power class just you know the people who were oppressed before we'll put them in power and then the people who were in power before now they can be oppressed like that's there's no relation to equality there whatsoever Oh yeah, the founder of, or one of the co-founders of an organization called FIRE, um, which I think is, I'm trying to remember the acronym off the top of my head, a Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education, uh, Silverglade I think is his name, but he describes himself as, you know, he's this kind of older Jewish guy, you know, if you picture somebody from the Bronx, he's got that accent and attitude, mm -hmm. like if you watch in a movie, kind of that stereotypical Bronx attitude. Yeah. But uh, he did an interview where he was talking about why he started the organization, and he's an old-fashioned progressive. I mean, he's an old-fashioned liberal. And he said, you know, I started this organization because I was one of the people in the 60s that were on college campuses protesting for our right to say what we wanted to say, to have a chance to speak. And he, he said, I thought that all the people that were there with me wanted that same thing. Hmm. But what he found out at, uh, was the people protesting with him weren't looking to have free speech. They were looking to have their speech. So when they took positions of power, when they became the administrators, when they became the professors, it switched the other way. They weren't um, stifling liberal conversation. They were stifling conservative. It, it just kind of flipped on its head. And, you know, as he kind of goes in this uh, interview, as he's talking about it and why he started the organization, he's like, that's not what liberalism is. That's not what being a progressive is. He goes, you know, we believed in where I grew up. We believed in the notion that uh, sticks and stones will break your bones, but names will never hurt you. You know, grow a thicker skin. Learn yeah. to, to stand the brunt of an argument and argue back. Uh, and I think that's really telling. I mean, here you have a guy that started this thinking that he was going to be like the um, ACLU. You know, he's going to have all these cases where it's like a conservative administration kind of uh, stomping down on a liberal student. And he was really shocked to find that it was the reverse, that he had a lot of conservatives or he had a lot of uh, straight white males coming in and saying, I don't know what the hell's going on. I, one of the cases, it was just mind boggling. They had a janitor who was also a student at the school. It was like a work study program. Mm -hmm. And he was reading a book. Um, I believe it was about the KKK, like a history of the KKK. And a female professor saw him reading this book and said, that's racist. You need to get rid of it. I want him expelled. I want him fired. And the school started harassing him. They started going after him. And they get, invi or they get involved. Fire gets involved. And they find out that not only is that the opposite of what the book's about, it's talking about the fall of the KKK. But the craziest thing about it is this book was in the school library. It's oh, something no the university, yeah, the university itself offers to students to read. So it, it's, I, I don't know what's going on with college campuses. I don't know what is going on with universities, but it's, it's mind boggling. It, it really is crazy when you think about it. That's kind of what uh, inspired a lot of the more recent videos to kind of get back to your first question hmm. of why I kind of switched tactics from just casually making fun of stupid little groups on the internet to talking about broader issues or talking about the craziness you'll see on something like Tumblr is because somebody has to. You have to be able to engage with this kind of stuff. You have to be able to laugh at it. If you can laugh at it, if you can mock it and call it out for what it is, you can sway people. And mm -hmm. if they laugh with you, they suddenly realize, wait a minute, this is really, this is really fucking stupid. What are we doing? And that's kind of, I guess, one of the goals of the videos. Yeah, it seems like there's no, like, there, there isn't. They're, they're basically the Tea Party of the left, right? Like these kind of groups of people. So it's there's no reason involved well, when you're when you're trying to deal with these kind of people. I don't think they're they can be negotiated with, really, right? They're just, they're really out there. Well, yeah, I think it's kind of um, 
I, I think it's a few things coming together to make the perfect storm. You have college campuses, which are basically promoting these ideologies and uh, this notion of victimhood to a large majority of students. It's not your fault that your life isn't the way you want it. It's somebody else's. Mm -hmm. So because you got the F on the test, because you didn't get the job, because you don't have a nice car, that's not because you lack work ethic or study ethic or because you didn't try hard enough. That's because there's a white guy standing over there. That's because there's a straight person down the hallway. That's because there's uh, whatever. You know, pick any group. You know, add to that um, technology, which is just, it's like fuel for a narcissist. Mm -hmm. You've got all these technological platforms and they can speak their mind. So what happens when you get all these people, <clears throat> pardon me, who think they can do no wrong and have technology where they can go on and talk about themselves completely? They compete with each other. It's a oppression Olympics. Who's the most oppressed? It's insane, but that's, that's what's happening. And it's like the perfect storm of being fed this ideology and being able to just constantly focus on yourself and inflate your ego. And everybody starts to compete. Who's the most oppressed? Who mm. has it the worst? You know, bring in the progressive stack. Let's, let's see where we measure up. So because whoever's the most oppressed always wins. You can't ever fight my argument if I'm higher up on the stack than you are. Check your privilege. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. It's kind of, it's a basically, the internet's a voice for retards. Or yeah, uh, it, it, yeah, it, it's, it's becoming that. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's strange to watch the transformation. Because I've used the internet for, you know, a decade plus, and, and kind of seeing the transition that's happened, you know, it was this wild west, where you could do anything, you could go to any site, you could do whatever you wanted, and it's just it's not that anymore, and it's getting stricter and stricter, and what I thought would be doing that, or what the the main force behind that, I thought would be corporations, you know, copyright protection. Um, maximization of profits, that kind of thing. That's always what I thought it would be. But it's turning out more than that to be users themselves. You're saying, oh no, you have to implement uh, speech codes, you have to implement stringent uh, banning you know, policies, you can't let this person speak, you can't let them sign up for an account. They're self-censoring themselves and it's just, it's crazy. It, it's, it's animal farm. You know, all animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. Yeah. You mentioned humor before too. That's another thing that these kind of people really have have trouble with. They don't know what a joke is, and they can't understand context. Kind of like the uh, the Colbert Report when he did the what was it, Ching Chang Ting Tong, <laughs> yeah, super uh, aliens or whatever. Yeah, yeah, that was that was pretty great. That led to uh, Sweet Park doing the cancel Colbert hashtag, <clears throat> which got her on Huffington Post. And you know, Huffington Post is usually very sympathetic to these people, but. Hmm. She got on there and basically told the host that he needed to shut up and check his privilege. Yeah. And you could see on his face, he's like, are you insane? And that was, that was the end of Suey Park. But yeah, Colbert makes a joke, uh, which was mocking something somebody had actually done, not about Asians, but he was parodying it. He was, he was showing you how stupid it was by mm -hmm. making fun of it. And they took it as a real thing. You can't make that joke because it's just as oppressive. Yeah. I don't even see how the oppression comes in. Like, it seems like, especially for a, for a girl like Suey Park as well, who lives in looked like a pretty nice apartment from the videos and is in part of actually a, a fairly privileged class in the US like a Asian Americans aren't um, in the ghettos right um, right that 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 too always kind of throws them off you'll, you'll hear a lot of SJWs um, you know social justice warriors talk about privilege and they define it in all these different categories uh, race sex all these things but they rarely ever talk about class they never talk about the economic situation you know, because what you'll more often than not find is the people that are screaming, check your privilege, are usually the affluent students. They're coming from really nice neighborhoods. Mommy and daddy bought them a BMW. Uh, they don't have to worry about college tuition. And so it's kind of, you know, it, it's silly to hear them saying that to people who maybe work their ass off to get to college or yeah. are struggling to pay their rent as they're sitting in the lap of luxury on Twitter or on Tumblr or on Facebook saying, no, you're horrible, you, you're, you have privilege, your life is easy, while they're making you know, minimum wage flipping burgers or uh, working as a car mechanic or whatever laborious task you can think of. You know, there's nothing wrong with it, but they never address that. They never address economics because it always screws up their arguments because then they might be the one that has privilege by their well, very definition. They're, they're tweeting on their $800 or $1,000 iPhones about how other people's privilege, right? So... Well, yeah, and that's the craziest, th or craziest thing. Um, I think it was Brianna Wu, uh, you know, related to the Gamergate thing, but talking about, 
she had made a lot of statements talking about things like all oh, these people have privilege and they're you know they're oppressors and this kind of stuff. And it turns out her parents had given her two hundred thousand dollars to start up her own game company. Wow. Um, you know she'd taken all these trips, so she comes from a wealthy family, and it's it's ridiculous to hear that kind of person say you have all this privilege. Well, I didn't get a quarter of a million dollars from mommy and daddy to go start a game development company. I had to work my ass off to get to where I am, kind of thing. You know what I mean? Man, my my dad gave me two hundred bucks once to buy a suit for a job, and he pardoned me because I couldn't afford to pay him back. <laughs> that was my privilege. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, yeah, it, it's just. It's really hard to keep your sanity, I guess, when you look at this kind of stuff if you don't try to take the tactic of making fun of it and having a laugh because it gets really depressing otherwise yeah. because you start to see that while to you it's funny and to an outside observer it may be confusing, but to them it's very real. They really believe this. I mean, they are really indoctrinated into believing the stuff they say, and that is a scary thing. It seems like, too, with the... Uh... Standing up to them seems to work really well in a lot of cases. Like you probably heard about the recent uh, Protein World uh, controversy. Uh, Protein World was great. Yeah, that's the best advice, and I really hope people follow that example. Is never apologize. Um, if you look at what happens to people that apologize to this sort of group, to these social justice warriors, they will nitpick your apology. Uh, they will tell you that you did it wrong. Um, Oh, who was it that played Wesley Crusher on Star Trek? Uh, do you remember? I know the dude, but yeah, I can't remember his name. Yeah, I'm blanking on it too. But he'd made, I think it was a post on Tumblr, where he's talking about like spirit animals. He made some offhand comment about it. Nothing, you know, nothing insulting. He was just talking about it. And people came in and screamed at him saying, you're culturally appropriating Native American uh, traditions and ideas, and you need to apologize. And he actually did. He apologized for it. And then they came in and said, you don't get it. You're a white guy. Stop mansplaining things to us. You need to apologize better. Wow. So, yeah, it, it, it's crazy. But if you stand up to them, like Protein World did, yeah. they shrink. There's nothing they can do. Their, their trump card is always saying, you're oppressing me. You're a bigot. You're a sexist. If you can just brush that off, that's it. That's, they're done. They have nothing else to do. That, that is their one trump card. They use a couple of words. They try to paint you as a bad guy using whatever language is the popular uh, phrase at the moment. But you shake it off, and yeah, you've got what's going on with them, which is basically great sales. Yeah. People think it's funny as hell. Um, it, and they're it was making. Hilarious. Yeah, yeah, it was. And it was, if, I, if I'm remembering this right, because I kind of read up on it as it's been going on, it was the two main guys behind the company. It wasn't somebody managing the Twitter account, it was the actual owners. Yeah talking on uh, Twitter, making fun of these people, which is just endearing. You know, I, I have no interest in their product, but I, I love the company for it. You know what I mean? It, it creates goodwill among people that are like, great, I'm glad somebody finally didn't cave into this. I'm glad somebody stood up to it and said, you're just being idiots. Stop. I actually wanted to buy, I wanted to, like I use a protein myself. I'm very active. Don't really need it, but whatever, I get it. But I, I wanted to order their protein because I thought, you know, fuck those SJW is, you know, I would support this company because they're hilarious and they're standing up to them. Yeah, I, I think what, you know, I, I hope other companies take notice because I think that it, it's kind of a weird marketplace. I think a lot of companies, or certain companies, I should say, found a, kind of a niche market with SJWs that they could sell them products that, you know, I don't know, reflected their ideas of, uh, of oppression, you know, like drinking male tears. You, you'll see those coffee mugs. I'm sure the company that sells it doesn't give two shits about SJWs, but they're probably making money hand over fist by selling them. Which, which one the, was this again? Um, on Tumblr, you'll see a lot of people drinking from uh, coffee cups, mugs, that kind of stuff, and they usually will say male tears on it. It's a, lot of, it's a kind of a feminist thing. Um, but I'm sure whatever company's printing those or making them is probably making money hand over fist. The opposite would be true, I'd imagine, as well, what you're seeing with the uh, protein world. Uh, mm. Stand up to them. Make fun of them. Have some fun. Don't back down. Your product is good. People will buy it. And they'll like it because you're, you're standing up to them. I think that's one of the problems with the world today is people have become, I don't want to say afraid or weak, but yeah, they, they've, they've shrunk away from the idea of conflict. Like anything to avoid it. Everybody's become conflict avoidant. Um, I, I don't want to have the argument. I'll just bow my head and apologize. Hmm. Well, don't. If you're not wrong, don't. That's that's the power these people feed off. They expect you to apologize. If you don't do it, it short circuits them. They they freak out. They don't know what to do. Hey man, don't mock people's triggers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're triggers. Uh, how insulting is that? Can you imagine 
being somebody that actually went through something, and not even just people that were uh, veterans of wars, but somebody that went through something that was just horrific. You know what I mean? Something that was just monumentally horrific. And they really, honest to God, have post-traumatic stress syndrome. They really do get triggered by a firecracker blown off by them or by a certain image or sound. And they're living with that, and they're trying to cope with that. And here comes some you know, 20-year-old white kid from the suburbs, and he's saying, please don't use the word orange. It triggers me. Oh, get the hell out of here. What an insult to people that actually deal with something that's hard to deal with. Yeah, I applaud you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks, man. But, um, yeah, it's it just, some, you, you have to stand up to them. You just have to. Uh, I, I think people are starting to do that. I've noticed it more, at the very least, which is good. Because I think if you stand up to it and you mock it and you have fun, you know, everybody watching will start to pick up on that. And it, it'll just, it'll become the stupid thing to do. Being an SJW will become stupid. And nobody will want to do it. You know what I mean? Uh, it'll be it'll be too you'll be too ashamed to act like that uh, because you realize you're just you look silly. What's it's really embarrassing. It's embarrassing seeing this stuff. It's just you know I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. That's that's the way to put it. Uh, I know it. Kind of uh, yeah. Uh, the more you talk about it, the more you kind of go over it. It kind of it just makes your brain short circuit. You, you kind of start to lose your ability to really process what the hell's going on because it just seems so, it seems like a joke. It seems silly, doesn't it? Yeah. Like this can't be real. This has to be a joke, but you're seeing it in real life now. You're seeing it on college campuses where people are getting protested because they, they want to give a speech where uh, students are getting expelled because somebody gets offended, where mm. college curriculums are being butchered because somebody might get triggered. It's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Speaking of which, there's a, you're probably familiar as well with this. Um, there was a guy who got banned from from participating in lectures because he brought up some good points about rape, you know, rape culture and all this kind of shit. Um, and he said nothing offensive, but apparently some of the people in the class, it, it, was it a gender study class? I forget what it was. But he made some points. He's like, what's this rape culture? And, um, you know, he's kind of challenged what the teacher was was telling everybody. Uh, but the teacher didn't like that and said, oh, you know, it's, you know, triggers or whatever. And he banned or he or she banned the, this dude from the class. No, that, that one I'm not familiar with. But I, again, it wouldn't surprise me. Um, yeah, I, I, what kind of college students are we really creating? I mean, you're going to take a class, you're studying the subject, whatever it may be. They want to give you assignments and tests that see whether or not you've been paying attention and what your interpretation of the information is. So are you allowing students to look at the information, interpret it, and then explain their interpretation and explain their reasoning behind it and maybe challenge that idea? Or are you creating students that are just saying what they know the professor or the group wants to hear because they don't want to fail? I mean, the, the big thing is college costs a lot of money. So what is a student to do when they paid thousands of dollars to get into this class? Are they going to risk it and speak their mind like this guy did? Or are they just going to you know keep their head down and let it get even worse? And I, I think that's part of what has allowed this to become such a joke is so many people were in that situation where they they heard a professor saying something crazy or they heard students in the class you know backing that idea and they're like god I'd love to stand up and say you people are insane and here's why but if I do that they're gonna fail me yeah. you know who's who's gonna look out for me kinda of thing um, and and that it's kind of spread and this has been going on for a while uh, if you go and look at the science wars from the 90s or Sokol and the Sokol hoax where he was talking about postmodernists coming into uh, scientific fields and giving these really bizarre gender interpretations of science or the just crazy stuff that didn't belong in actual hard sciences mm. so he created this hoax where he wrote into two of their best journals right and he he wrote what they wanted to hear it was complete nonsense nothing was real that he wrote but he used a lot of really big sounding words and he told them what they wanted to hear and they published it and heralded it as this great thing wow. and the moment they did it he came out and said it's complete and utter bullshit and you're idiots and this was in the 90s, but I mean, so you see people in the STEM field that kind of saw this coming and like, what the hell's going on? And now, well, here we are 20 some odd years later, and it's just, it's spread everywhere. You know, people didn't pick up on those kind of early warning signs, you, you know, going back to Silverglade, saying, hey, once we switched power in the 60s and 70s, it started to kind of metastasize, and by the time we got to today, it's just, it's this full-blown tumor, what are we going to do? How are we going to excise something that's almost bigger than the host itself now? Yeah. What, maybe, maybe, it, maybe it had a chance to grow just because it seems so ridiculous to a lot of people. Maybe people just didn't pay attention to it till it really like sprouted and took off. 
Yeah, I think that's part of it too. Um, yeah, because I, I would suppose, you know, a student goes to class, they hear all this crazy stuff, they do whatever they're going to do to get their grade. They come home, they're sitting with their family, and they say, yeah, God, you wouldn't believe what I heard in gender studies, or you wouldn't believe what my sociologist professor told me. And the parents are like, oh, yeah, yeah, whatever. Did you watch the football game? So you have that happen enough times, you know, fast forward 10 years, and now you're at the point where it's no longer just talking about that one crazy, or that one crazy day in class. It's that one crazy semester in class, because it's every day now. Because they've, they've gotten to the point where they're like, oh, well, nobody's complained to this point, so I guess it's completely acceptable to act like this. So you have incidents like the feminist professor of, I think it was porn studies. There was a, a group on a college campus in California. I think it was the University of Santa Barbara again uh, in California. And they were doing like some pro-life rally, whatever. A typical college <clears throat> typical college stuff where you'd see groups out protesting. You know, like you'd have occasionally like preachers out there. You'd have, you know, hippie students out there, you know, legalized pot or, you know, uh, do this or do that. You always see that kind of on a college campus environment. This particular group was abortions bad, we're pro-life. Mm -hmm. And one of the girls had a sign. Well, the professor walks by, sees the sign, and says, she's triggered by the image. And she assaults the kid carrying it. And it turned out to be an underage girl. So she hits her and takes a sign from her. And then has other students hold the girl back so she can take off and destroy the sign. Wow. And this is a college professor. This is a person on staff. The college defended her, saying, oh, well, she was triggered. The assault's OK. What in the hell? That that's absolutely insane. Doesn't it, doesn't you think that kind of contradict the you know the idea of personal space and not attacking people in general? Well, I guess it only counts if it's on Twitter. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it's the. Um, I, I'd love to get into the somebody had wrote. Uh, if you look it up later, you probably can find it. Um, talking about Kafka trapping, uh, like if you know. Uh, the, it's hard to explain, but Google it if you get a chance. It's really interesting. But it kind of talks about this mentality of using an argument that's so flawed that the only reason you're using it is basically to bully the other person into going away. And that's kind of what their ideology is. Um, it's this notion that, yeah, you may, you know, I may set the rules for the game and you come on the board just like I do. But the second you have an advantage, I'm going to change the rules or I'm going to reinterpret them because you're more privileged than I am. I'll just mm -hmm. use whatever word I need to use to make my actions acceptable and yours unacceptable. So you have an adult who's a professor at a college assaulting somebody who's doing a protest, and it's perfectly acceptable because she was triggered. Where if that had been a male professor who was conservative and that had been a pro-choice protester, what do you think would have happened? Oh, he oh, would have been he would have been hung out to dry in the press. They would have talked about how assault cannot be tolerated on college campuses. It's unsafe. He needs to be fired immediately. The college needs to apologize. We need to have courses and uh, you know seminars so everybody can hug and talk about the experience it, it just I, I want to see a world or I guess let me put it this way I'd like to see colleges where it's just equal opportunity at the start everybody gets a fair shake and you're judged on your ability to produce results mm -hmm. how well do you do in your classes that's all we care about we don't care about anything else but it, it, it's becoming very quickly um, a place where the moment you walk in, you're judged on all these other factors that you never should be judged on. I don't care what color you are. I don't care what sex you are. I don't care who you choose to have sex with. All I care about is how well you do on your test, how well you do on your assignments. Are you paying attention? Do you, do you care about the courses you're taking? You know, how do you rank up against other students? But that that's kind of been lost. I, I don't know what happened to that. Or at least to me, that's what education was. You know, it was kind of a, a, a meritocracy-based system, mm -hmm. a, and it's not anymore. Even with economical things, like you can see, like the feminists still go on about the uh, the wage gap and um, what was this other thing? There's been studies showing that actually there's been preferential treatment for hiring women for certain kind of positions, right? And I think that they did a big study with a bunch of universities for hiring of of women versus men on for certain positions, like. A, educated positions basically and, and the women were chosen over the men by to a large degree right so even when this when this kind of thing happens you know it's still not enough they still want to keep pushing that envelope um for more and more dominance like it's not even this the whole facade of equality is kind of out the window well yeah yeah and that's i think one of the most insulting things kind of about um 
you know, I, I guess I would place all these groups under social justice warriors, really. I, I picture at this point it's become so pervasive that any group you can really think of, they've pretty much, or at least attempted to be, co-opted by this point. Uh, you saw this take place with um, atheism, mm -hmm. with the, or atheism plus. Yeah. You can't just be an atheist, right? If you're just an atheist and you want to go to a convention, that's not good enough anymore. You need to be a feminist. You need to be this and this and this, because if you're not, you're a bad person and you can't hang out with the group. Mm. And you see that that took place with feminism, that took place with atheism, that took place with any group you can imagine. And they've all been kind of uh, pushed under this umbrella of social justice. But um, these people don't, it, it's never been about equality for them. They, they, don't, they don't want an equal world because in an equal world, they wouldn't be able to compete. They want special privileges. They want to be, uh, like you said earlier, the elite class. They want to be the person at the top because that's the position they crave. They don't, they don't want to give you a shot at that. They'll use anything they can. And if their studies are outdated, if their information is bad, if their data is flawed, they'll just ignore it or they'll keep using it. And if you try to correct it, well, you're mansplaining. So you need to shut up and check your privilege. Yeah, they want to make gender studies a, uh, the kind of study you can do to get a high-paying high job after university. Yeah, that's ridiculous. I, I've heard a couple of uh, you know, horror stories, really, about college campuses wanting to make mandatory classes for things like, yeah, gender studies or uh, just things like that, but for degrees that have nothing to do with it. Like, if you're going into college, and it's especially if it's STEM-related, if you're going in to do math or engineering or whatever it may be, mm -hmm. and they're telling you you need gender studies, oh, that's, that's ridiculous. I don't know how that's going to help you, you know, complete an equation or make sure your bridge doesn't implode. But that's kind of what they're pushing because they want everybody to feel uh, you know this new this new doctrine the new dogma of the current uh, age which is if yeah which is essentially either you should feel really good about yourself and because you're oppressed or you should feel horrible because you exist and and the thing is you know I, I talked about this previously as well to me the notion of privilege is secular original sin you're born with it you can't do anything to get rid of it and, you know, unlike, uh, you know, the uh, religious idea of original sin where you could, you know, pray to Jesus to make it go away kind of thing, yeah. there's no way to get rid of it if you're born white, you know, or if you're born male or if you're born straight or if you're born any of these groups. And the crazy thing is they're moving the goalposts now. It used to be just if you were a straight white male, you were, you know, on the shit list. But they're expanding the shit list now. Mm -hmm. So now if you were a straight, uh, you know, Hispanic male, if you were a straight black male, um, they're even going after gay people now and saying that they're appropriating culture from uh, black women. Yes, I saw uh, that. How insane is that? So it, it's growing it now. They're, they're starting to kind of group together even more people and say, oh, you're all privileged. Uh, who's going to be left at the end? I mean, what, what are we going to be looking at uh, at the end of the day, you know, 20 years down the line? Who's going to be the most oppressed? It's going to be one type of person. I don't know who it's going to be yet, but it's going to be silly as hell to look at. I'll tell you that much. It's going to be all transgendered people in wheelchairs who are uh, running the world. <laughs> well, it, yeah, if you, if you kind of want to get an idea of this, there's a, a YouTube video um, that it, it's just funny as hell. Uh, I think it's called Cultural Marxism Assist Story. And it was it's an argument between um, a, a, a couple of lesbians that are LGBT members, right? And they're having like some kind of meeting on college campus. And in comes this group of hipsters that identify as being transsexual. And it's them arguing with the lesbians for like 20 minutes saying that because you don't want to, and they, they actually say this, because you don't want to lick my trans clit, referring to their penises, you're sexist and oppressing us. And the lesbians are responding, are you insane? I like women. I don't want to have sex with a guy. And it's the, the you know, this group is saying, no, no, you don't understand. We're, we're, we may not be female bodied, but we're female. And it, 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 this is what college camp that that video is probably the best example of what college campuses are becoming, and you'll see what, how they dress. One of them is wearing a cape, has no shirt on, her breasts are hanging out, and she's got like neon skirt on. The other looks like Justin Timberlake, and they're screaming at these lesbians, saying, "You don't understand. You know, we're more oppressed than you. You should feel bad." And the lesbians' response is, "What in the hell's going on? This is crazy." And it goes back to what I was saying: they're expanding that group. You know, now they're talking about gay men being privileged as opposed to just straight men. Well, now they're going after lesbians instead of just straight women. Uh, so at the end of the day, I don't know what that, that most oppressed group is going to look like, but <laughs> that, that video might give you an idea of where it's going. Was, was that a satire or was it the real thing? 
No, that is a very real thing. This was an argument that was filmed on a college campus. Wow. I don't know who filmed it or why, but they were probably like, holy hell, what, what's going on? Um, it, it should still be up. It's like one or two parts, and it's just their argument. But it's so insane when you watch it, and you're just thinking, <laughs> what, am I, what am I watching? What happened to colleges? I was sort of joking when I asked if it was satire or not. I assumed it was satire when you were talking about this. Oh, no, no. It, it, it is very much real. Um, and the arguments they use, the guy actually says to uh, the lesbians uh, that you know were having their meeting, "You need to check your fucking cis privilege." He actually says that. He's pointing, he's waving his finger at them, telling them to check their cis privilege, because this is Tumblr in real life. It's now on college campuses. Wow. What, what's your what's your take on the whole transgender thing too? Like besides people who who actually, I guess they get really serious about it and they get the uh, gender reassignment uh, surgery. What about, like, it seems like, the, especially on Tumblr, of course, there seems like a lot of people trying to choose genders which don't exist. Um, well, yeah, I, I'd separate it into a few things. Uh, like, people have asked me this before because I, I would have a Ask FM account, so I get a lot of questions, um, and then I'll give an answer, but I guess nobody ever... Ask FM's kind of off the beaten path kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, my my opinion has always been this. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you are. I don't care how you live your life. Um, if you've got a sense of humor, I will sit down and have a beer with you. That that really, at the end of the day, is my opinion. As far as transsexuality goes, I, I think there's something going on that's probably... I, I know there's a term for it. I'm using the wrong term, but it, uh, essentially akin to body dysmorphic disorder. I think something's going on that's compelling them to do this, and I don't think it's because they're female in a male body or male in a female body. That's my personal opinion. But, you know, as a caveat to that, I'm not going to go up to the guy who wants to get a tattoo or a piercing and tell him, you can't do that. How dare you do that to your body? It's your body, man. If, if you really want to do it, if you want to take hormones, if you want to uh, get surgery, go ahead. It's not my place to tell you not to do it. Uh, I think you've got some stuff going on and maybe you should really consider that before you go in for a massive surgery that could have some serious consequences. Mm -hmm. Um... But yeah, I'm not. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna shit on you for it. Uh, as far as like preferred pronouns, though, if you're up in my face calling me a, a, a cis gum and telling me that I need to call you Zer Zer and Zoom, uh, I'm just gonna laugh at you. That's not gonna happen. But if you're just a normal person and we're shooting the shit and you want me to refer to you as a chick, I don't care. It doesn't doesn't bother me. As far as the gender thing goes, um, I know what you're talking about in regards to that as well. Kind of on Tumblr and stuff. Mm. Yeah, I think it's everybody wants to with gender, and especially if I don't know if you've noticed this, but like with um, mental disorders, is really popular too. Everybody's got like a flavor of the day, self-diagnosing something. Um, I think it's Munchausen by internet. Uh, mm. You know, I think it's this idea that people want attention. So how do they get attention? Well, they get attention by making themselves the most unique case that exists. So I'm no longer straight or gay. I'm suddenly asexual, polyromantic, uh, dwarfkin, and I have got self-diagnosed Asperger's and cancer. Mm -hmm. And don't you dare tell me otherwise, and if you do, you're a cis bigot. Um, I think, too, you know, especially with the online kind of world, even going back to transsexuals uh, and gay people, really any group you can think of, you've got all these people on the Internet pretending because they want attention, and they are misrepresenting the group they're trying to claim to be a part of. Mm -hmm. And so it puts people off of them. I think, yeah, I, I, I think at the end of the day, that's one of the biggest issues with social justice and that kind of mentality. They pretend to be part of this group, not because they want equality, but because they want to be powerful and they want to be unique and they want the most attention. And so they misrepresent the group they're claiming to be a part of and it puts forth this bad image. So you meet all these people online who are like, I am a you know, I am all these things. I am a feminist. I am a vegan. I am a this. I am a that. And they're the biggest asshole you've ever met. And so suddenly you think what they're identifying as and all these groups are claiming to be part of must be complete and utter assholes. It'd be like if you didn't know what atheism was and all you ever saw was atheism plus, you'd be like, wow, atheists are just jackasses. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, I, 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 yeah, it's a dangerous trend, I guess, is really kind of how I see it. You know, I, I, I've been open about this in the past when people have asked, uh, I, I'm conservative leaning uh, in my political views and kind of just my my life. I'm kind of a traditionalist in that way. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it, it, that doesn't mean that I'm going to dislike somebody because they're different. I can sit down and talk with somebody who's got a completely different ideology than I do. 
I don't have any problem with that. I'll sit mm -hmm. and argue with you until we're both blue in the face. I'm fine with that. As long as you aren't this type of person. This type of person really kills any ability for people to debate and reason and argue with each other in the way it was meant to be done. Um, and yeah, you, you can't even you can't even see a contest of which ideology is best anymore because they've polluted everything so much that you, you couldn't get uh, a staunch conservative and a staunch liberal to argue something or a straight person and a gay person to argue something because you don't know. It could be a crazy ass SJW in the mix and they've completely skewered what the real argument would have been and turned it into a shit show of look at me I'm oppressed and how dare you argue with me check mm -hmm. your privilege poison the well yeah that's exactly what they've done they, they've they've absolutely done that they've they've poisoned everybody's well we're all drowning in poison at this point yeah with all this stuff I've seen like I, I consider myself uh, very liberal and progressive although I don't, I don't know if I want to use that word anymore but <laughs> with all the stuff I've seen like I, I found myself siding on the side of a lot of cons you know people who have conservative points of view, in ter at least in terms of like the SGWs and the, the feminist kind of stance. When they're when they're critiquing these people's uh, craziness, I'm always, I find myself quite often on the side of the conservative people. I'm like, you know, I don't consider myself conservative, but I, and I, I don't really care either. It just for me, just the the evidence matters more than anything. It's much more than the ideology of calling myself. Uh, liberal or conservative that I think that's just kind of uh, horseshit anyways it's kind of like you know it's tribalism is you want to be fit in with your group or whatever it has the same ideas as you but you know more and more I've seen conservative uh, opinions which reflect my own uh, with these kind of you know regarding these kind of people um yeah I, I, at least in a, uh, you're from Canada right yeah, I, yeah I, I don't, Vancouver. Okay. okay so I, I don't know kind of the roots of uh, your version of progressivism uh, or however you'd say it um, I believe in America, like the Progressive Party, I think was started by, it used to be the Bull Moose Party, so I think it was started by Teddy Roosevelt. Um, it sure as hell isn't what people call progressives nowadays. Yeah. I mean, uh, Roosevelt, here's a guy that went to go give a speech to kind of give you an idea of the old, uh, the old progressives, <laughs> or the original ones, the Bull Moose. Uh, he goes to give a speech, right, for his presidential campaign, I believe it was, hmm. and as he's up on the podium, he gets shot in the chest and he doesn't go to get medical attention he stands for one hour bleeding and gives a speech then he Brutal. goes to the hospital yeah no now idea. that is yeah th but that's not the image that comes to most people's minds when you say progressive is it I mean here's a guy that took I've never seen a politician do that if you showed me a politician that got shot on television and gave him a one-hour speech afterwards I don't care who he is I'd vote for his ass but you know it's that kind of staunch strong independent uh, make your own way kind of attitude that's been lost uh, and again, they've they've kind of taken that and poisoned it. Uh, it's really the the caricature or the caricature. Oh God, I'm stumbling over my words. Yeah, I think you know what I mean. But yeah. of of what it is to be left leaning now. You know, in America, for decades, when you talked about a conservative or a Republican, the joke was people would envision in their head some hillbilly guy in overalls driving his pickup truck down a dirt road with a I love Jesus bumper sticker, Confederate flag, and a shotgun on the rack. Now that's flipped. Now the left has their own version of that, and it's some morbidly obese, twenty-year-old white kid from the suburbs who considers themselves asexual, polygendered, you know, has the hipster glasses and screams privilege at everybody. And that's really what's happening. Is they've they've made what it is to be part of that group a joke. Um, and I think I think what we're starting to see are liberals kind of waking up to that and saying, "Holy shit, that's not what we are." We, yeah, we, that is not at all what we are. Yeah, <laughs> so you you are not who we are. You do not represent our ideas, um, which is good. I hope they wake up to it. Uh, I think SJWs and that kind of mentality and what you're seeing uh, kind of play out in the news with all these different groups uh, doesn't do anybody any good um, at the end of the day. And it just muddies the water and it shits everything up. And I think it would be great if every group, regardless of political ideology or whatever uh, kind of divisive line there may be, just stood up together and said, shut the fuck up and go away. Yeah. <laughs> You're ruining things for everybody. Keep the crazies in check. Yeah, exactly. You know, shitting, speaking of shitting everything up, it kind of reminds me of your last, uh, your most recent video in the, released in the last couple of days. Oh, the Nick Bates one? Oh, man. Yeah, that one, that one made, I, I woke up in the morning actually cringing thinking about that. <laughs> yeah, that that's a crazy one. I, I, that's a guy that's been around for, and I should use allegedly a lot when I say this now because I don't want Nick 
going crazy and filing some civil suit, even yeah. though I doubt he'd have the ability to. But uh, this is a guy that was around for six or seven years, um, who had made postings online, who had made uh, music and videos and statements, and had chats in IRC and with other people, basically saying that he wanted to molest kids and that he was molesting his eight-year-old sister or eight-year-old half sister. Mm -hmm. um, and then spent the majority of the years following that st those statements and those actions saying, no, I didn't really mean it. Well, finally the law steps in and says, you, you're in a lot of trouble, Nick, because the girl finally came forward and said that it was completely true. Mm -hmm. But it makes you wonder, I mean, here's this guy that ran around the internet for six or seven years saying, I molest children. Uh, I'm totally for molesting children. Uh, here are videos of me talking about it, and here are music uh, that I'm singing about it, and here's me confessing to it, and nothing happened. Mm. And, and it's kind of crazy. You, you'd think I, I know different uh, websites, different boards did get involved. Uh, kind of, I think around 2011, when they when they heard this, and wanted to contact the parents involved and see if they could take action, or wanted to contact the police or get somebody kind of cued into it because they thought, holy shit, if this is legitimate, this guy's a danger. Um, but it took her coming forward to really get any action. And what makes it even more horrific uh, than just the molestation, really, is who he was as an individual and the fetishes he engaged in. Because when you find out that he's a corporophiliac and he's into scat play and all this kind of stuff, and he doesn't shower and he doesn't bathe, um, and he, just all these horrible kind of personal hygiene things, and then you think of what that poor kid had to go through. Not just yeah. to be molested, but to be molested by somebody like that, I, I feel for it. I can't imagine... Um, what her childhood was like. I, I know the parents intervened. I didn't get to talk. Uh, there was some stuff I didn't get to talk about. I know the parents did intervene um, around 2010 or 11 and make it so he couldn't come over to the house. Uh, basically, they had found some stuff he had written, like erotic stories, on her laptop uh, that he had written on her laptop, and that had made the stepfather, you know, um, uncomfortable. And he said, "I don't want this person around." It's understatement. Uh, yeah, exactly. I know that he ended up going to live with his aunt uh, in an apartment she provided because he said he had social phobias and he couldn't get work and he couldn't leave the house and he had to stay at home. Uh, and so he kind of was sequestered off on his own for all these years. And maybe that's why uh, the girl, it took her coming forward to do something. You know, maybe he was kind of off on his own. It gave her time to really go through what the hell happened to her and kind of comprehend it and come to terms with it and finally say, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go forward and talk to the police. Um, but yeah, just a disgusting individual. Uh, I, I know a lot of people talk about low calls on the internet, you know, these people that are essentially the butt of every joke, who do really ridiculous things and everybody likes to laugh at it. Uh, one of the prime examples of that would be somebody like uh, Christian Weston Chandler, Chris Chan. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with him, just look it up and believe me, you will be amazed at his history. Now he's currently facing potential prison time because he was upset that the new Sonic game had a Sonic mascot cutout uh, that didn't have the correct arm color. So he went to a GameStop and pepper sprayed employees. Oh, shit. But he has his entire crazy history. Now, that's the most he's really... A, well, he's had some other crazy things that have happened, too. But that that's kind of like the typical idea of what people think when they think of this kind of person. Um, Nick Bate, on the other hand, is something well beyond that. He is a very disturbing individual. Um, and that's kind of why I used him as, I guess, the first episode for that, that series. I originally... It, the Internet Insanity series was originally about legitimately crazy people. Um, and it was more, it wasn't really making fun of it or really talking about it to bring attention to it. It was just using it as kind of a, um, a sample of a specific thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the first video I did was about gang stalking. And I used a guy who really believed in gang stalking. Uh, oh, yeah, I saw that one. Yeah, and I felt really bad for the guy. Uh, the problem with it is, you know, that's fine if you've got maybe... 50 subs or 100 subs because you don't have to worry about people going to give them shit. But if you've got 10,000 or 20,000 people watching those videos, one or two of them are going to go screw with them. Mm -hmm. So I, that's why I switched kind of the the scope or the point of what the series was about. I figured if I'm if I'm going to talk about crazy people on the internet, I might as well talk about the ones that deserve ridicule yeah. rather than ones who are legitimately in a bad spot, um, as interesting as that is to me. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that that's kind of why I changed that up. But Nick, Nick Bate is a uh, well, I should probably call him by his proper last name, but that, that's what he's known uh, by online. But just a horrific individual. I'm just really... And the defense video, uh, which kind of closed out the video, the audio track that I played, because I couldn't obviously put this video on YouTube, 
of him, his whole defense strategy being, I'm a corpophiliac, I couldn't have molested my sister, and I'm going to prove it by masturbating with uh, feces, yeah. is insane. And the craziest thing about that is, if the police are involved, that video is going to obviously be logged as evidence, which means that some poor jury at some point in the future is going to have to sit and watch that video in a courtroom full of witnesses and judges and bailiffs and the stenographer, and they're going to watch this uh, morbidly obese man uh, who's completely unkempt masturbate with with shit uh, for five minutes. And I, I don't know what he's thinking. Um, like his situation right now, if, if I'm up to date on it, he has $150,000 bail. He obviously knows he's going to pay that for him, so he's in jail right now. Mm -hmm. I think that's where he's going to stay until he gets his trial, and I, I can't imagine him being found not guilty with the enormous amount of evidence that exists. I mean, what I showed in the video was nothing compared to the wealth of stuff that's out there, and it, it's stuff from people who know him personally or who had contact with him, who have logs and records of all these interactions. So there's no way he's getting off um, I don't know what his prison sentence is going to be I know one's a felony and three are misdemeanors uh, people I think somebody had thrown out the number like 40 years mm -hmm. uh, but yeah he's he's going to be going away for a long time for what he did when I watched that I, I literally had physical reactions like I was grabbing my face and like like you, you can't help it right it was, it was insane it, yeah it's very cringe inducing yeah. um, it, it really is a kind of a hard watch uh, especially that last video um yeah, I, I think he might be one of the worst people I've ever seen online, uh, to be honest. And I've seen a lot of really uh, messed up individuals, but he—he's just—he's hidden all those, all those watermarks for just uh, uh, being a truly terrible person. And it's—it's it's pretty remarkable. I've never really seen them all gathered together in one individual like Nick Bate. So, I've never uh, even heard of something like this before. I just, it, that was really um, y your your content is very eye opening. I'll just say that. Well, it, yeah, and the crazy thing is it, I like uh, – I, I guess I should touch on this really quick. I don't mean to kind of ramble, but oh, – no, go ahead. Um, like the videos I like to listen to on YouTube are long videos. Um, that's why a lot of my content is like a half an hour. Uh, I, I consider it something like white noise. I don't expect somebody to sit there and watch their monitor for 30 minutes. What I expect is if they're, if they're interested in the content I produce, they're going to have it playing in the background while they're doing something else. So kind of like a radio. It's yeah. white noise. It's in the background. It kind of keeps you occupied, and maybe you're like, holy shit, what did he say? And you go and check out the computer monitor to make sure that you didn't mishear something. Um, and so, you know, I, I try not to go too long. The problem with Nick and his whole story is there's so much stuff out there, and there's so much stuff I didn't get to include. Uh, I, I mentioned it in the video, and then I, when I rewatched it recently, I was like, oh, God, I completely forgot to put this in there. I had mentioned briefly that he liked to paint with uh, feces, that's not just me saying that. He has tweets in different uh, journals and blogs and statements out there talking about how he likes to paint his walls with poop and urine, and he thinks that's great art, and he can't oh. understand why people have problems with that. Like, this is a very messed up individual. And then even on the, uh, like, assorted information you can kind of find on him that's been passed around was this uh, psychological evaluation. I wanted to include that too, but I couldn't trace it to anything. Like, a lot of the stuff I can trace it to his actual accounts or I can trace it to people that know him. Uh, with the psyche valve, it was just a paste bin, so I couldn't put it in. But it seems, it looks like it would be real. It's a lot of stuff to fake if it's not a legitimate psyche yeah. But, you know, it talked about him and basically said, no, he's not autistic. Uh, no, we don't believe that it's this or this or this. He has actually a really high IQ. He has a social phobia, and that's those are his issues. Um, so, at least for me, that gives me some comfort because I don't think he's going to be able to go into court, even though the, the video is called Internet Insanity. I don't think he's going to be able to go into court and say, I'm not guilty by reason of insanity. Yeah. Uh, they're going to say, no, that's not going to cut it. You knew what you were doing. You knew that it's wrong. He even made statements saying that, uh, you know, in his mind, he had made the statements, well, pedophilia, you know, I'm a, I'm a pedophile, but I don't act on it, so it's not wrong. But, he, you know, he's differentiating. He's saying then that if you do act on it, it is wrong. Mm -hmm. So if they prove that he did act on it, by his own statements, he's damning himself. Yeah, he so knows. it's one of those things, yeah, he knows. He, he has a comprehension that what he did was wrong. So I don't think the I'm insane defense is going to work in his, uh, in his specific case. You reminded me of something else, not, not related to this guy, but related to uh, some uh, painting craziness. Did you see the thing about the, the feminist who painted with her period blood and painted it on her face too? Um, well, I, I've seen it, and again, it, it's crazy. If we were talking five years ago, it would be that one thing. 
I, I've seen a couple of things like this. Um, I think it's interior semotics, where it was a, a woman who was in an art gallery and took a can of SpaghettiOs and put it inside her vagina. Um, there was another one with a woman who put paint balloons in her vagina and squatted them out onto a canvas. Uh, there's a movement called free bleeders who don't wear any pads or protection and think it's totally natural to bleed all over the floor and on their shoes. Um, there are, I've seen some really horrific stuff when it comes to this kind of free woman spirit stuff. Yeah. Like, that's kind of the heading I put it under. Uh, there's one really infamous post of a woman who took, um, I don't want to gross whoever might be listening to this out, so you might want to skip forward a minute here, but she took uh, discharge from her period, you know, the kind of the material that sloughs off, Maybe. and cook, cooked it up in a frying pan, because she said it looked like bacon, so she cooked it up in a frying pan and ate it. That's brutal. That's horrific. But, um, so like I said, if we were talking five years ago, I know the specific thing you're talking about, because the internet is crazy now, it's hard to nail it down. So what, what exactly uh, did this person do? I'm not even sure anymore after hearing that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know it's it's mind blowing, isn't it? It might have been on. Um, maybe you you've uh, followed. Um, I think Sar Sargon of Arcad or Arcad. Oh yeah, Sargon. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, th I think he made a video where I saw this, it, uh, or maybe it was somebody else. I don't know because there's so much shit out there. But yeah, just she just. I, I think it was just a picture that was uh, posted up, and she painted period blood like on her face, like face painting. And um, and she also made a painting with period blood, and it was some kind of like feminine liberation uh, bullshit. So, yeah, that 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 is getting kind of a, a boost right now. Um, I'd say over the last year, uh, you'll see. Like I said, I mentioned the free bleeder thing. Um, there's another one where they'll take their period blood and use it to cook. Uh, they'll make cookies and brownies with it. Wow, uh, it, horrific, really, when you think about it. I can't think of. I, you know, I don't want to take anything that's been discharged out of somebody's body, really, and cook it up and eat it. There's nothing that you could really tell me you're producing that I'm interested in consuming. No. Uh, it, it, anything that you could really name is going to make me want to vomit. So I have no idea why this is a thing, but it is. And if you dare to go on these these blogs or these sites that talk about it and say, this is this is horrific, you're horrible, what are you doing? Yeah. You're going to be screamed at for being um, you know, a caveman and not understanding the modern world. It, you know this 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 kind of stuff confuses people too, or confuses guys about women, and it's funny. And I've seen the kind of distinction here between like when guys say, "Oh, women are crazy," or and I don't know what they do because they say this and that, and everything's confusing. But it's more like crazy feminists saying one thing, which is doesn't go along with reality. Is it very disconnected? And then there's regular women who are not part of that crazy camp, and you know. But it's confusing a lot of like normal guys who see this stuff and think, "Oh, uh, women," but it's not women. It's feminist. Right. Well, I, I would suppose dating culture is going to really take a hit, especially um, in any school setting, I, really, from high school through college at this point. What, I mean, what, what are we creating? It's creating an environment where women are going to be made to think that every guy is a rapist, so they're mm -hmm. going to be scared to go to parties, and every guy is going to be you know, convinced that every single woman out there is a crazy person who is going to you know, call the police because they held their hand. Yeah. Um, you know, it's making men and women afraid of each other. What What in the hell are we doing? Um, yeah, it's limiting human interaction. It's 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 bizarre. It's another bizarre thing to watch happen um, when you're creating a situation where you're making people afraid of each other for for what? For fear of something that might happen, but not something that has happened. Um, I mean, my God, look at the recent cases that have been taking place on college campuses. You know, you bring up feminism. Uh, was it Meg Lanker Smith? I think was a, a, f a female college student who had posted uh, about harassment she was receiving on the school's Facebook page, and a statement was put up that said, "I want to hate fuck Meg Lanker Smith. Um, I'm a conservative, and I'll teach her how to be a good conservative bitch." That was uh, essentially kind of what it was saying. I'm, I'm condensing it, but. Um, mm. Police investigate, college holds a rally because obviously this is terrible, it's patriarchal and misogynistic, and the police come back and say, you don't really need to hold your rally, the person that posted it was Meg herself. Oh, no shit. Yep, it was her and her husband who orchestrated it, um, and the craziest thing about that, they still held a feminist rally. So uh, regardless was... of the facts, they still had to go... And right. Yeah, exactly. Um, the mattress case, the mattress girl, like, I can't remember the specific name of the case, but you saw what happened to him, a German student, I think yeah. it was, or somebody from Europe, Yeah. Um, kept quiet, did what the school said, the school found that he was not 
they had run three or four investigations by that point and said, we, we really don't see him having committed rape against this particular student. Uh, and he gets slandered in the papers. She makes herself out to be a victim, does this school art project. She carries a mattress around to remember her rape. Um, and basically, he's he's made to be a pariah on the college campus. He he has a scarlet letter he must wear for the rest of his time there. And finally, it's enough. He can't take it anymore. And he comes up publicly and says, guess what? I have chat logs of every conversation we had before, during, and after her allegations. Mm -hmm. And here's her talking about wanting to have sex with me. Here's her talking about getting drunk and getting STDs. Here's her calling me up and wanting to talk after telling that I raped her. Um, and did anybody turn around and say, we made a mistake? No. Well, look at the Rolling Stone article. You, you know, what, what in the hell is going on there? Uh, another classic example, and I wish I could remember the name of this particular video, but it was shot on kind of like, a, you know, I'm trying to think of where this exact location was. It was off the college campus, but it was kind of in a district where there are bars and restaurants for college students. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a drunk couple. Girls drunk, guys drunk. Girl has the guy on his knees eating her out in public. They're both completely just hammered. All the college students are clapping and whistling and doing what you'd expect college students to be doing. Yeah. Um, she gets filmed. She's waving at the camera and smiling and grabbing him by the hair and, you know, whatever. Video gets posted. She says she was raped. Uh, I remember that. Everybody looks at the video and says, what in the hell are you talking about? Uh, and, and the thing, too, people on scene were like, yeah, she told him to keep going. She was grabbing him by the hair. But, I I again, it's, it's creating, like I said, a situation where every woman will view a man as a rapist for any action he takes and every man will view a woman as crazy mm -hmm. and so you you you're creating this this environment this atmosphere where you, you know nobody's going to want to interact with each other again it's killing what college is about i'm not saying you're supposed to go get uh, completely hammered and have wild sex or anything like that but you should be able to date each other or hang out at a party together or study together and be able to walk by each other on a college campus without feeling afraid of each other. Why create an environment of fear? What does that serve? Mm -hmm. um, what was it? The, uh, the rape statistics, uh, that, that famous study, what is it? One in four women will be raped. Yeah, one in four, one in five, something like that. Yeah, that was based on flawed data, uh, essentially. Or, uh, people have pointed out it's wrong for a lot of reasons. But if you go look up like the crime statistics of, like le let's say, a Detroit um, you'll find that your chance of getting mugged while walking down the streets of Detroit in the worst possible neighborhood at midnight are less than being sexually raped on the, the campus of Harvard. Okay, something's really screwed up if that's, if that's what you're trying to tell me. Yeah. If you're telling me that being on a college campus in broad daylight is more dangerous than being on the streets of Detroit in the middle of the night with a wad of cashing in your pocket, you've got an issue. Something is really screwed up here. Or South Africa. I don't know what the, the rape stats for South Africa, but I saw a comparison before for, you know, saying, like, really, is the, like the campuses in the US, USA are more dangerous than the country in the, which has the highest rape stats in the world uh, in South Africa, like actual people getting raped? Oh, uh, yeah, I know it's, um, it's funny you bring up that. I, I know it's an African country. I can't remember specifically which one is at the top of the list. I know the second place one because nobody ever believes it, which is Sweden. Sweden has, in the world, the second highest rape uh, statistics. Oh, no kidding. No no kidding. Uh, now, that was a year or two ago. I don't know. Maybe it's changed radically since then. But, um, yeah, that's, that's off topic. But I, I've always been really stunned by that particular number because nobody would really expect it. Must be all uh, the black metal. <laughs> yeah, it's all, it's, all their, uh, yeah, it's all their music that's doing it. Satan and but, blonde people, it goes together. Uh, yeah, there you go. But, um, yeah, yeah, it, it, it's crazy. Um, I don't know why it's it's being allowed, and I think one of the other problems that you're running into is when a college campus or when students get involved in something like this, whether it's a hoax or somebody blowing something out of proportion, like in those three specific cases, um, nobody ever steps back and says, we were wrong, this didn't happen, we should make a, a system or put something in place to ensure this doesn't happen again. Uh, look at the Duke Lacrosse case. You had the infamous letter of 88. 88 faculty members condemning the Duke lacrosse players, saying they're all horrible rapists and they should never be allowed on campus. And then it comes out, it's completely fictitious. This never happened. Mm. Those 88 professors are still employed. They were never fired. And they never apologized. Uh, I, I just, I, I don't get it. Um, you know, if, if you screw up on that level, you would expect them to say, as a institution and as faculty of that institution, we made a really big mistake. These people were innocent. Uh, we had faulty information, or we let our emotions lead us, and we should have looked at it more critically. 
but they just don't. Um, so I, I feel bad for college students. Uh, you're walking into a minefield. Find a good college. <laughs> really pay attention to what the hell's going on. I wish there was a a version of rate my professor for rate uh, for colleges, where it would just be people giving honest impressions of what the college environment is like, so you mm. could see it before you go to apply there. Yeah, it's kind of like these kind of people have a free pass. Like you can make it rape rape rape, rape accusation or other agree, you know egregious claims, and if it's wrong, you can you don't have to retract it. It's still okay. Like that's fine because men are rapists naturally. So. <laughs> Oh, yeah, and that's the, that's another crazy thing to me, uh, especially in the situation you brought up earlier, uh, I think, with the whole um, drinking thing. You were talking about the, the college talking about how if a woman is drunk um, and a man is drunk, the man's at fault. Uh, because women can't consent when they're drunk yeah. for some magical reason. Um, but what is that saying about women? I mean, you, you have these people that are supposedly pushing forward the notion that men and women are equal in mm -hmm. every conceivable notion, in every conceivable way. But then you're telling me that if a woman suddenly drinks alcohol, she's a baby, mm -hmm. whereas a man isn't. So alcohol affects them differently, so they're not equal. So is that because their brains are different? You know, they'll never go beyond that, right? They'll just say enough to say that uh, magically if she has a, a glass of wine or a beer, suddenly she can't consent to anything because she's a, she's a child, unable of making her own decisions. We need to coddle her. But that, that horrible man over there, he can drink a bottle of Bacardi 151 straight and totally acceptable for him to make decisions. Um, and even using the alcohol example, if you get drunk and get into a car, guess what? You're going to go to prison if you get caught. Mm -hmm. They don't care that you're drunk. You can't say, well, I was, I was uh, under the influence, so I'm not responsible for my decisions. No, you were totally responsible for your decisions. You chose to get drunk, and you chose to get in that car. Um, yeah, I, I just I don't, understand, I don't understand modern society. Something got really screwed up somewhere, and um, it really got out of hand, I guess. Mm -hmm. And I uh, keep waiting for somebody just to say, I keep waiting for the cameras to pop out and go, you know what, it's all been a joke. This has been one massive reality TV show that's been running for 20 years. Uh, and I hope you found it funny because that's not what the world's like. But I don't think that's going to happen. Yeah, like the Jim Carrey movie where he was his whole life was a movie. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't think we're going to get that. Yeah, I have a feeling that this is not going to be a Truman Show, that this is the the real deal. So hopefully people will dig their heels in and fight back a little bit. There was a case over here, in, uh, in I believe here in Vancouver. Anyways, it was a Canadian case happened, which, which is kind of actually a positive thing. This girl accused this guy of raping her. And, of course, he spread, she spread rumors about him on, on social media and all that stuff. And he's getting harassment and death threats, the typical stuff. But... He wasn't even in the same city at the time of the rape accusations, and he had solid proof that he wasn't in the same city. And, <laughs> and the good thing that came out of this was that he, he won the right. I think it, uh, it, it should be a criminal case as well, but at least civilly, he won the right to sue her because there was solid evidence that she had made a false rape accusation. Yeah, that, that's the other thing that uh, I think is really stunning in a lot of these cases where they turn out to be completely fictitious, where it's not, uh, where a real rape hasn't occurred, where it's complete bullshit, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, it's amazing to me that the people then that have made these false accusations, that have caused all this trouble for the people involved, that have wasted uh, the time of local government and universities or whatever institution they might use to perpetrate their lies, are never held accountable for them. If I go to the police and say, my neighbor just killed somebody, you need to investigate it, and then they find out I completely made that up, you can bet my ass is going to face some consequences. So why is it when somebody says, you know, if, if I went to the police and said, oh, no, he raped somebody, suddenly that's okay? Mm. I mean, you're ruining people's lives. You're, you're using the police as a way to, you know, uh, exact revenge on somebody for whatever petty reason you have. And that, that's ridiculous. There should be consequences. I think if there were consequences, um, you'd see this happening quite a bit less. But right now, people know they can get away with it. So they're just going bananas with it. So you have people like Meg Linker Smith. You have the case of that girl and the guy on uh, the strip next to the bar. You have the case of the mattress girl. You have all these different examples that have kind of popped up more and more as we've gone forward over the last couple of years. And nothing ever happens to them. Mm -hmm. Or if, they, if something does happen, it's always a slap on the wrist. And you're, you're allowed to go. Um, and I've seen some crazy rhetoric to defend these kind of actions. I've seen people say things akin to, well, uh, you know, it's terrible that this person was falsely accused, but at least that lets them realize how prevalent rape is. So they should be happy they learned a lesson. You know, what the hell are you talking about? Yeah. Uh, you're you're going to destroy somebody's life because you've got some bizarre, grandiose vision of what your ideology is? Like, 
go fuck yourself. You can't you can't do that with people. Um, yeah, it's just it's disgusting. It really is. I saw I saw actually an argument on social media. You know, obviously a place where credible people uh, speak. All the time, yeah. All the time. <laughs> but it was funny regarding the mattress case, you know, because all the evidence came out about all the texting and the fact that she wanted to hang out with him, like after the you know the alleged rape. Mm-hmm. And it was interesting that these people, these were obvious SGWs, um, but they were arguing that you know, giving anybody who makes a rape accusation like a, a free pass for anything. They're saying basically the evidence doesn't count. They're like, oh, you know, you have no right to judge how a person reacts after a rape. Maybe that's just the way her personal, personally, that's the way she reacted to that rape by messaging him to hang out again, right? It's like yeah, there's, I, I, there's like no the standard. Yeah, it's it's crazy. I mean, I, I do know that people do react to crimes differently. I mean, it, you know, you look at any, God, I, I'm sure everybody's watched one or two episodes on TV, like true crime kind of stuff where they're talking about a murder. Usually it's a murder. But they're like, oh, the, either the spouse or whoever found the body acted this way. And sometimes people act really screwed up. Yeah. But she was acting really weird for weeks and months after this. This wasn't like the next day kind of thing. This was a week later, hey, you want to get together and have sex kind of mm-hmm. thing. And that's how she's dealing with it after reporting it that's how she's dealing with it are you are you kidding me you, you don't think the police would have informed her hey don't ask him to have sex with you if you're accusing him of rape you don't think the college would have said you guys shouldn't have any contact with each other that might be a, a, an issue going yeah. forward um but it, it goes back to that notion that what's going to happen to her nothing she knows nothing's going to happen to her so she'll say whatever she wants and the mainstream media and a lot of these outlets rolling stone for uh, example will publish it and smear somebody and then not fact check stuff and it, it's it's absurd yeah total free pass um the, I believe in the same social media thread too the people the same people are arguing this this case about you know they'll react you know you can't judge somebody for way, the way they react um, they're also saying they kind of they want it seems like they they wanted to change the whole legal system and it, for in the case of just rape the man is guilty until proven innocent. So now he has to prove that he didn't rape her as opposed to proving that he did rape her. Yeah, I, I think a lot of these people don't study history very well. They don't understand what a legal system looks like with that kind of principle of yeah. guilty uh, until you can prove innocence rather than innocent until proven guilty. Um, <laughs> how do you prove you didn't do it? You know what I mean? Yeah, prove uh, negative. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Glenn Beck, famously, you know, he would always do these shows, right, where he would say, now I'm not saying Obama's a communist, I just want to know why he won't tell us he's not a communist, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So people in reaction to that used that kind of approach to him. So they said, I'm not saying Glenn Beck raped and murdered a girl behind an Arby's uh, in 1998 in Florida. I'm just asking questions of why he won't prove he didn't. You know, that kind of thing. Uh, that's the kind of logic they're using. Why can't you prove that you didn't do it? Well, no, the burden of proof should be on the person making the accusation. I shouldn't have to defend myself when you can't even present evidence that I committed some kind of a crime. Because in that that scenario, in that kind of a world, why not just go accuse everybody you dislike of having done something, and then if they can't somehow prove that they didn't do it, well, they're going to jail. What a great way to get rid of people who you just don't agree with. Um, you're creating gulags, and they don't realize that that can switch on them really quickly. You, you put a system like that in place, and one day their ideology isn't the one that's going to be running it. And they're going to find themselves in some prison camp because they had wrong think, mm-hmm. or they didn't agree with the, uh, the new ideology of the day. And they'll have no way of proving their innocence, and they'll, they'll wish they had never put forward that kind of an idea. It reminds me of a famous time in history where, um, you know, this whole uh, the witch thing. Prove you're not a witch, and they would, they would actually dip people underwater for five minutes. And if they died, they weren't a witch. Yeah, it's brilliant, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. so yeah, if you die, whoops, we're sorry, um, but at least you died innocent. Yeah. But if you don't die, well, then we're going to kill you. So yeah. really, you're walking out of that situation dead either way. Um, yeah, it, it really is uh, Salem Witch Trials it mm-hmm. is essentially what they're trying to create, that kind of a, that kind of a system. Um, and that's, that's what's happening right now. I really want to stress this. If you look into this, that is what is being put into place on college campuses in America right now. The college campuses are being asked to investigate these kind of reports on their own, outside of police investigations, and make their own determination of innocence or guilt using their own criteria. And if they find a college student to have committed some crime, regardless of what it is, they can expel them, they can publish their information, they can do whatever they want. 
but they're being compelled to do this. Uh, this is kind of like a government mandate now. So it's scary when you hear people expressing these kind of opinions on social media because you're going to start to see these systems put into place in the real world. Um, I think eventually what's going to happen, if I remember right, and again, I'm sure historians are going to get on my ass about this, but if I remember right, the Salem witch trials stopped when they accused the governor's wife. Uh, uh, I, they, 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 they accused somebody a little too high up, and they're like, okay, enough of this this crazy shit. I think that's going to happen with the college campus things. I think somebody's going to make an accusation against somebody who is the son or daughter of somebody who is very powerful and wealthy, and they're going to have picked on the wrong person, and that uh, that parent is going to unleash holy hell on them, and that will be the end of it. But what scares me is how long is that going to take till that happens, and how many people are going to be expelled and have the de you know their chances for a degree ruined and their futures ruined uh, before that takes place. Um, there really should be safeguards in place. Uh, I think uh, the educational system, at least here in America, I don't know how similar it is in Canada, but at least here in America, is just, it's very biased towards students. It's an industry. It's, a, it's I'm paying money to get a service. So there should be some kind of a, a safeguard in place to protect my consumer rights. Yeah. Um, and I don't, I don't, I think that's lacking. I think that's why you have a lot of outside organizations like the ACLU, why you have FIRE, why you have all these different groups that exist because college students are put in a position where they paid money for something and now they're having their life ruined because somebody on campus is triggered or offended. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's wrong. It's disgusting. Have you seen the, the, the this reminds me of a, Sim, a Simpsons episode, episode a long time ago when I used to watch it. Um, in Flanders, the, the Christian, he, there was some parallel universe or something. They went into the future and Flanders was, the, was like the overlord. And everybody was being sent to get a lobotomy so they could be good Christians, right? <laughs> so I, I kind of picture like this, this future world with, uh, with hipsters giving everyone lobotomies so they could be uh, politically correct enough. Yeah, yeah, it, it, the kind of thing where it's, it's forced on you. I mean, it already is forced on you, kind of touching back to what I had said with getting a bad grade. Um, it's going to spread beyond that to are you going to behave a certain way outside of class on a college campus if you're going to risk offending the group that has the most power right now and who can influence the dean and can influence people in positions where they can get you thrown out of uh, school and can get the school newspaper to print up how you're a rapist and can throw a protest and get a YouTube video that gets uh, 50,000 views that basically say your name, your location, where you're from, what you're studying and say that you're this horrible person without providing any evidence. Um, yeah, it's going to create just a really shitty atmosphere. Yeah, I think there, were, there was one of those uh, those atheist meetings or skeptics meetings too where something like that was uh, already happening where they made rules for your conduct conduct outside of the convention. Yeah, uh, uh, to me, uh, you know, uh, and again, kind of watching this, I, I guess, explode on the internet. Um, I, I think the Science Wars, I think Sokol was kind of like um, the canary in the coal mine. Uh, kind of warning everybody ahead of time something bad's coming down the line. Mm -hmm. And then I, I think you started seeing groups slowly kind of getting picked off one by one. Um, the atheists, for whatever you think of atheism, you know, outside of that opinion, were one of the first groups to kind of stand up and say, no, no, this isn't going to fly. This is crazy. Uh, take your atheism plus and shove it. We're not interested. Uh, you can say what you like about our, our ideology and our, our belief system, but we are not going to uh, be bullied into acting a certain way at our own conventions. Um, and there were a lot of people that put videos out um, and really pushed back against that and said, this, is, this isn't this is going to fly. Uh, and yeah, yeah, it, it just, it's just, I, I, I guess you look at it so much and you see this happening so much, especially in entertainment. You, you've got stuff like Gamergate. You've got stuff like uh, what happens in uh, comics and movies now where it's just, these, these people complain about everything and mm -hmm. they just, they get their way every time. And it's getting more and more obnoxious, and it's starting to interfere with people's ability to enjoy uh, content and even just life itself. Um, yeah. Because you've got these people just pushing and becoming overbearing um, and trying to create, uh, I guess, the left version of the moral majority. Uh, if you're an American in the 90s, you'd remember this. You know, conservative family values, the moral majority, uh, we're going to kind of tell you how to live your life. Mm -hmm. And people didn't want politicians doing that. And that's kind of gave the Republicans, I guess, a black eye for a while. Mm -hmm. And they learned from that. But now it seems like the other side is doing it. And for some reason, nobody's calling them out on it. And I, I just I can't understand that. I don't know why we don't see more people 
of all spectrums coming out and just saying stop. Uh, just, just please stop it. Uh, you're ruining everything. Was well, that tr whole trigger thing, right? Everyone's crumbling at the uh, in the face of uh, an argument instead of uh, defending themselves. They back up. Oh well, yeah. I, I had a video on the uh, Internet Aristocrat channel, uh, CETA, which is the I, I, God, what was it? The College or something Educational Debate Association. Um, you can look it up, CETA debates. Um, if you want a, an idea of kind of like this pervasive, just ridiculousness of how arguments are, are structured, if you think in your mind of what a classical debate is, I think most people have the same kind of image of two different opposing viewpoints making their points and arguing against each other. And whoever put forth the best argument and countered their opponent the most will win. Mm. If you go and look up the CETA events from the last couple of years, you're going to see people who aren't making any arguments, who are rapping and talking about oppression and talking about how the debate itself is racist and so therefore they they should win by default because it's a racist a patriarchal thing and there's no way they can win so therefore you have to let them win um that's one small example but i mean again look at what they did to debates yeah go look at the CETA stuff it really is mind-boggling and i'm looking at this like are, are you kidding me and then I, I and then i find out who runs it and it's run by the heads of like 15 or 16 really large universities Mm. And they're all for it. They think it's this. They, you know, they think it's the best thing ever. They think this is the wave of the future. Um, and all it's really doing is killing what a debate was in the first place by letting this kind of victim complex, PC overkill, uh, SJW stuff get into something else and infect it and ruin it. Um, yeah, yeah. I, you know, I, I use uh, image boards a lot. I go to a different lot of boards and. One of the threads, or one of the themes I, I like the best are kind of these bleak visions of the future. You know, what is the future going to be like? And so it usually starts off like the years 2055, Feminist Zone 19, talking about, you know, having to take your, uh, you know, uh, patriarchy pills and just crazy stuff like that. And, it, you know, it's funny to laugh at. And it's a great way to kind of blow off steam. But, God, the rate we're going, it might not be that far off. Yeah, I get a, people basically got to balls up and uh, just... Just say no. Yeah, that, that's, I, I guess at the end of the day, if I could condense all of this down, that would be my point. Whatever your viewpoint is, don't get bullied into giving it up just because somebody calls you a bad name. Don't apologize to these idiots and have a laugh at them because they should be mocked and laughed at. The more people that laugh at it and the less people that give in, the sooner this will go away and we can get back on track and actually have arguments and debates and go back to being normal and enjoying ourselves it seems like they're just making everything unpleasant for everyone really right now yeah that's the, the irony of the bullying too it always seems to be these uh, people who end up being the biggest bullies of all um but and on on that note i guess we'll end it there it's been a really awesome discussion is there anything else you uh, want to leave the audience with uh no god i, I think i've rambled on enough i don't want to I, I don't want to put them to sleep too much but um no no i i've, I've enjoyed uh, coming on it was a uh, good talking with you and it you know, I we, think, we've uh, covered quite a few bases here on the, uh, today's program. Yeah. <laughs> it was a long one, yeah. But it was awesome. No, uh, thanks a lot again, uh, Mr. Uh, Medoker, formerly uh, <laughs> Mr. Uh, or, uh, Aris Internet Ar Aristocrat. I can't even think anymore at this point. That's fine. Uh, yeah, that happens to me too when we talk about this kind of stuff. My mind just goes blank after a while. Yeah, I think you lose brain cells after a while thinking about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it really does do that. Start drooling out of the corner. But awesome, yeah, <laughs> thanks again, and thanks everyone for watching.